So it is my privilege to introduce um, Olivier Diens, who is Deputy Provost, Student Life and Learning. And as we know, this is a very good combination because life and learning are inseparable. They're so meshed together. One doesn't come without the other. So Professor Diens acts as a central liaison with the senior administra uh, administration, the faculty, student organizations, and the Senate. So he's got a lot of lines out. His charge is to ensure that the impact of university policies and practices on student life and learning is factored into all decision making. Dr. Dienz, you may be sure that we, as lifelong learners at McGill, um, consider ourselves to be in your charge. An artist and a poet, Olivier Dienz is a professor of French language and literature and deeply interested in the study of cyber culture. We're confident that the students at McGill have an adequate an advocate who thinks widely, deeply, and very far. So thank you for coming today, and vous êtes le bienvenu. Thank you so much. It, it, it is an honor to, uh, to be here. It's an honor to be uh, among all of you. Je vais dire quelques mots. Uh, je vais vous dire quelques mots en français pour vous uh, souhaiter la bienvenue à McGill. Mais uh, c'est difficile de faire bilingue parce que là, mon, mon cerveau a des problèmes uh, droit gauche. Donc, uh, je commence en français. Ensuite, je vais aller en anglais parce que je suis pas capable de, de faire les deux. Alors, uh, bienvenue à McGill. Bienvenue à, à Montréal pour ceux qui ne sont pas de Montréal. <coughs> so, I, instead of uh, they've asked me to welcome you on behalf of the Provo, but I said, well, instead of doing the usual thing, McGill is great, this, that, you know the story. I said, why don't I, why don't I try something a bit different, uh, considering that uh, you are uh, uh, students at McGill. So, what are the challenges, and why do we need lifelong learning? So, I'm a big fan of technology. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I like toys. I like stuff like this, and I'm most of the time I'm an optimist. Uh, but there's things that are on my mind right now, and I think they can be perfectly addressed by lifelong learning. So, the, you know, and I'm going to talk for not, for not for very long because I'm not the keynote, and certainly, you know, I wasn't supposed to be the keynote. I'm going to just a little five minutes to give you a trigger on, on how to think about these things. So, yeah, you have the name of the talk here, and let me let me try with this this first quote from Ray Kurzweil, and he says, "We won't experience 100 years of technology technological advance in the 21st century." We will witness in the order of 20,000 years of progress when measured by today's rate of progress. So, you know, uh, we think we're in the middle of a technological revolution. Uh, the revolution has not even started yet. Once artificial intelligence, uh, big data, the internet of things, driverless cars, CRISPR, which is a technology to manipulate genes, 3D printing, when these things will start being omnipresent and talk to each other, and be all over the place, our lives will change dramatically. And it won't happen one day, like you won't have a robot, a la Schwarzenegger, coming up in a room and saying, I'm taking over the world. These things will happen without us even knowing about it, right? Your GPS is getting better every day, your calendar is getting better every day, and suddenly it's like, wow, this is very cool. Amazon is making you better recommendation, and AI comes in, and one day we'll open up and we'll you know, wake up and say, oh my god, these things have changed. So, we suddenly have this huge amount of power, and it's a responsibility that all we all have, how to address this power and how to address, address it correctly. So there's a famous uh, writer of science fiction, his name is William Gibson, and in one, of, in one of his interviews, he said, we're in the middle of this moment where it's both terror and ecstasy. It's both a nightmare and Christmas morning at the same time. We walk this tightrope between extraordinary things happening all the time and things that make us uneasy, uh, scared, worried about things. And I think we can always, you know, as, as Student Life and Learning, and my colleague uh, Chris Buttle, our Dean of Students, will speak to you with Gerald this afternoon, and Chris will say a couple of things about today's student's body. We see this, and it's a bit different, and we're, we're a bit, we're amazed by the things they do. We're also amazed by the things they don't do, don't want to do, and, and, and this is just, just a very difficult uh, time to be in. So we're in the middle of this terror and ecstasy, and then we have fundamental challenges for us. 
But the key is us. That is, that is the point of this technological revolution. We know how to make machine things, machines think. What we don't know is how to make them thoughtful. Now, the key is we don't know how to make ourselves <laughs> thoughtful most of the time. That's what we try to do at a university, but you know, we, we, it, it's not a very scientific thing. We know what wisdom, we know how to recognize wisdom. We don't really know, you know how to create wisdom except for age and maturity and experience. But this is key, because what's going to happen is machines will do and will take on more and more responsibilities. They'll take on more and more life and death decisions. You will have the driverless cars soon. You already have, um, you already have um, machines that kill by themselves for the army. You have all of these things that will make, you know, they will be involved in healthcare. They will make financial decisions. Those are important decisions that they will make, and they will need to make them because the world is too complex for just all of us to be able to control it. And they will take over, and not, not negatively, but they will make a lot of our important decisions. How do we make sure that they will make the right ethical decisions that we think are important? How do we make sure that these things are programmed within the machines? So the key, first of all, is us. And we have two tasks. The first one is to educate humans, to educate, mentor, train, and civilize machines. So we'll soon, it's already starting, but soon you will have machines that are so powerful. We already have machines that think, well, they sort of think, but they do very amazing things. We already have machines who can recognize your face and see the types of emotions you have, much better than human beings, by the way. They can actually know exactly the type of things you're, you're thinking. We have machines that can do, uh, that can be uh, counselors, psychological counselors. We have all of these machines. So we have all these great machines coming. They are all very powerful, but they lack wisdom and maturity. Our role together is to make sure that we train the next generation with your help and with your, your wisdom and maturity to ensure that they will be then able to educate machines and get them at the level of ethical responsibility we want them to be. Because the second task is we must rethink the foundations and boundaries of ethics, philosophy, law, humanity, and machines. Things will be so brand new that we will be faced with ethical problems we've never seen before. And our ethical foundations are not enough to move forward. We new, need new ethical foundations. We need new ways of looking at the world. I'll give you a simple example. I was listening to a podcast the other day about driverless cars. So you know the famous, you probably know the famous thing about driverless cars. The car is moving on. 99% probably of accidents and death that we currently have on highways will be elimin eliminated with driverless cars. There will be a few of them. It's unavoidable. So you have this driverless car moving on the highway, and suddenly something happens. It's a typical philosophical argument. The car can go and hit three people, or the car could turn right and kill one person. However, that one person is a five-year-old child, and the three people over there are adults. What does the car do, right? These problems will show up. And I can go even a step further because cars soon, you know, they, they look at the world through radars. They will soon be connected to the internet. Not only will they know that this is three adults and this is a child, they might even know that, okay, those are wealthy people, influential people or not. This kid has issues. Where do I go? These things will need to be programmed into machines. Self-killing machines, army, drones, we need to program them so that they do the things that we're comfortable with and that we know are right the way we move forward. So foundations will be huge, new foundations, and more than ever, we need wisdom, we need maturity, we need experience, compassion, flexibility, the ability to work in the gray areas. And of course, this is where we need all of you because Lifelong learning is how we can get this amazing thing, which is maturity, compassion, flexibility, the ability to see the world in different shades that young people are not used to do, right? It's just normal. When we were all 20, that's not the kind of thing you do. You're full of passion and energy, and you see the world in black and white. But most of them will probably program machines, create machines, put them on the road, put them in our society, so we absolutely need to bring these two together. 
these intergenerational learning is absolutely necessary today. It's absolutely crucial because we know how to be powerful as human beings and more and more. I'm not sure we know how to be thoughtful, again, to come back to this thing. So this is why we need this. This is why this conference and this topic is absolutely crucial for today and tomorrow. Thank you.